Globally, we now consume 4 billion tons of oil every year. Oil spills from shipping accidents and offshore blowouts are rare, but when they happen, the impact on the environment, on livelihoods, and on the local economy can be severe. In this series, we'll be asking the key questions. What issues do we need to consider? What expertise and techniques are available? And how do we deliver a well-planned and executed response to minimize impact? In this film, we'll be looking at some of the first things to consider when planning a response. In particular, how different types of oils behave in the marine environment. But first, I'm going to find out a bit more about the history of oil spill response. The giant tanker Torrey Canyon, a ground off lands in. In 1967, the world watched as the Torrey Canyon tanker spilled 119,000 tons of oil into the sea off the UK coast. On the Seven Stones Reef, 16 miles off Land's End, she lies like some stranded ocean monster shedding her life blood. The impact was widespread, threatening livelihoods and resulting in the death of thousands of seabirds. At the time, the Torrey Canyon was the biggest ever oil spill and the first involving the new breed of super tanker. The authorities struggled to coordinate an effective response and in some cases made matters even worse. Naval vessels joined the dispersal fleet which was shadowing the slick and bringing in thousands of drums of detergent to try to break it up. The know-how for dealing with spills on this scale simply did not exist. Surely it's time there was an international effort to beat the menace before it gets completely out of hand. In operation since 1968, ITOF is now the maritime industry's primary source of objective technical advice about marine spills of oil and chemicals. Set up in the wake of the Torrey Canyon, it's a not-for-profit organization funded by the shipping industry. I want to find out what they're all about, so I'm visiting their headquarters in London to meet with Managing Director Karen Purnell. Karen, tell me about the role of ITOF. What exactly do you do? Well, ITOF provides technical advice on oil and chemical spills, and we provide that to the shipowner and his insurer, and also to the local governments, local environment agencies, and to all of the people affected by the oil spill. And how involved are you in the process? Do you get involved right at the beginning? Absolutely, yes. As soon as we get the call, if it looks like it's going to be a serious incident, then we may send one or even two people straight out on the next flight and uh, going to the country and being there as quickly as possible. ITOF has attended hundreds of spills, including all the major tanker spills in countries around the world. Partnership with the global spill response community has been vital in responding to and learning from every incident. And as well as that experience, you have a tremendous amount of expertise here. I mean, what sort of people, what sort of qualifications do you have within your team? Probably the most important qualification is stamina, diplomacy, <laughs> as well as a very strong scientific background because they're going to go and have to deal with some very emotionally um, intense situations where people are quite upset about a situation. They're going to have to apply their science but also try and calm the situation and, and provide reassurance. <laughs> Just one of several oil tankers which have collided in the world's busy shipping lanes in recent years. ITOF's first decade in operation was a baptism of fire. <laughs> the 1970s saw around 25 major tanker spills every year. 
incidents releasing over 3 million tonnes of oil into the sea. A black tide of oil from the wrecked tanker Amoco Cadiz with a cargo of 220,000 tonnes of light Arabian crude. Within hours, the Liberian tanker had disgorged fully half its cargo of 6 million gallons of oil, according to Coast Guard estimates. But since then, the number of major spills per year, those over 700 tonnes, has dramatically declined. So back in the 1970s, we were having 20, 25 large spills from tankers, and the total amount of oil spill was in the hundreds of thousands. Now, if you look at the last decade, two spills on average, and probably talking just a few thousand. If you compare that to the quantity of oil that's actually carried by sea each year, it's a minuscule amount. So fewer spills and less total volume of oil spilt. What would be a, a typical incident today? We're seeing more spills, probably smaller volume, from the fuel oil uh, carried in ships like container ships and bulk uh, carriers. So those now make up a, a larger proportion of the spills that we attend. And what challenges are posed by bunker oil or these heavier oils? Well, the type of oil that's spilled is much thicker, it's more persistent. So that oil can stay at sea for much longer, it doesn't break up like the lighter oils. And when it does come ashore, it tends to smother things, it, it can become very tarry and very difficult to clean. So it's, it's more of a challenge when it comes to the cleanup. So even if you're dealing with a smaller volume of oil spilt, the technical challenges seem to be just as great. Absolutely, yes. And the same emotional challenges, and actually even a small amount of oil through fish farms and seaweeds can cause a great deal of damage. As the challenge evolves, ITOF continues to advise on clean-up strategies and the effects of spills on the environment and people's livelihoods. I want to find out how the lessons learned from previous spills can help us plan, respond and react to future incidents. Beginning with one crucial factor. Following any incident, it is really important to consider the type of oil that's been spilled. Responders need to establish quickly what they're up against and tailor an appropriate response. When it comes to crude oil, the thing to remember is that it's a complex mixture containing many different hydrocarbons. Their physical properties can vary widely depending on where they're found and how they were formed. I've come to Cedra in Brittany, a specialist research centre, to find out how different oils behave in water. Annabelle, sometimes when people in the public think of oil, they think of just one thing, but it's not quite as simple as that, is it? No, actually, oils are all mainly composed of hydrocarbon, but actually their properties and composition can vary a lot. And here you have like some sample of three different types of oils. We're going to see how these oils differ in their behaviour, starting with the lightest, a diesel. You can see it's, it's like a bit like water. It's got a low viscosity, low density. If I pour it in the seawater, uh, it will spread really quickly. OK, and we can see that, can we? And, and we can see that. The surface spread could be quite impressive, but the volume itself may be quite small. Uh, just to give you an example, one litre of diesel will actually can cover up to uh, a football pitch surface. So it is, it's quite incredible. It's so quite a very, big. very thin sheen. Yes. As diesel is highly volatile, it will evaporate quickly into the atmosphere and won't persist long in the marine environment, meaning a cleanup is rarely necessary. Next up, a medium crude oil, much more viscous than the diesel, and immediately you can see how it behaves differently. What's happening, you can see uh, that it's, it's spreading a bit, mm. but not as much as the diesel oil earlier. Around 20 to 40 percent of the crude is made of light products as well. So these 20 to 40 percent will naturally evaporate as well, reducing yeah. the volume of the crude, but leaving some heavy compound in the, in the marine environment. And finally, heavy fuel oil or bunker oil. It's this that's used to power ships and it can represent a serious challenge for cleanup. Because it's very viscous, it won't disperse as much, it will not evaporate. Usually you have less than 5% of light product. It really clings together, doesn't it? Exactly. 
So you see a tiny bit of the light compound evaporating, but almost not spreading a tiny bit, yeah. but mainly the thick slick. Fuel like this can persist as a semi-solid material at sea for a long time. It's clearly a completely different proposition to the crude and the diesel, and it's crucial for responders to understand these differences in order to apply the right cleanup techniques. But understanding the type of oil is only one part of the jigsaw. You've also got to take into account how it will behave at sea. At sea, most oil was spread rapidly, potentially covering hundreds of kilometers in just a few days. As it's subjected to waves and wind, it'll undergo a range of physical and chemical changes known as weathering. Understanding weathering and how the individual processes affect the behavior of oil is the cornerstone of oil spill response. So I want to get to grips with the basics. This piece of equipment is capable of simulating these processes. Now, beakers in the laboratory are one thing, but this is really stepping up the scale. What's going on here? Well, uh, we are here uh, in the polydrome, uh, and you can see here on a much smaller scale what will happen at sea. You have the wave, you've got the current, the turbulence, uh, and you have the wind. And so it will alter the composition uh, of the oil. Two days ago, this medium crude oil was placed in the polydrome in order that the effects of weathering could be observed. You can see already uh, it's very different to the one we had in the beaker. Uh, you can see here is much more viscous, the color change. Uh, the reason is, is because the light compound already evaporates uh, and uh, you have different phenomena that um, started already. The one that has the most action is uh, what we call uh, water in oil emulsion when you have droplets of water um, that are mixed in the oil. And that will increase the volume, sometimes up to five times. Wow. Uh, yeah. Uh, and uh, it will give this um, consistency. It's a bit what we call sometimes a chocolate mousse in, in the slang. So the volume of this oil has changed even in two days because yes. the water droplets in the oil is making it spread out, increasing the volume. Exactly. And it's, very, it's going to be much more difficult to deal, to respond to this type of oil than to fresh oil. Oil will also disperse naturally into the water column as this experiment demonstrates. Larger droplets resurface, but smaller droplets are kept under the surface by the turbulence. They're diluted and eventually broken down. Natural dispersion is a key process for responders to understand. Just how important are experiments like this for understanding the behavior of oil? It is really important to understand how oil behave so you can be prepared in case of a spill, if a spill occurs, uh, to have the proper equipment to respond to a particular type of oil. So there's a lot of variables here. <laughs> a lot of variables. That's why this type of apparatus is very useful. Processes such as spreading, evaporation, emulsification and dispersion interplay differently with different oils. Understanding this is critical to planning an effective response to spills. Take a look at this. In 1989, the Exxon Valdez runs aground in Prince William Sound, Alaska. A large proportion of the crude oil comes ashore and the environmental impact in particular is severe. But now look at this. Four years later, the Brer is blown onto rocks off the Shetland Islands more than 85,000 tonnes of oil spill into the sea. That's twice as much as the Exxon Valdez, so you'd think the impact would be twice as great. The Shetlands were braced for catastrophe, but it never arrived. In fact, the economic and environmental impact was relatively small scale, and there was little need for a spill response operation. The answer to why rests in understanding the types of oil spilled and how they interacted with the conditions. Dr. Tim Linnell from ITOF attended the incident. Tim, this is a huge spill and yet the shoreline isn't too badly affected. So what happened? Well, it was very much around the fact that the oil that was spilled was a light crude oil uh, called Gulfax and that was very low viscosity. 
Uh, and so it actually didn't form the sort of water and oil emulsions, which can make many oils very persistent uh, on the sea surface. And of course, then added to that, you can see the crashing waves there. Um, and you know, the force uh, or the winds there was forced 11 to 12 winds, gusting 13, 14, so it was pretty wild out there. Uh, you can see the waves actually breaking that, that slick up and dispersing it into the water column. And in fact, if you look around the brayer itself, the vessel itself, you can see that kind of coffee-coloured plume to it. Yeah. And that's actually the visual evidence to show that the oil is being broken up into these really small oil droplets. So something like really tiny ones, about 70 microns in diameter, and then just diluted over time. Wow, and you can I mean, see the energy of those waves. How long do those conditions carry on for? Well, that was the thing, those conditions carried on for 12 days or more. So that kind of continued to break the oil up and spread it over a very large area. The heavy seas also had uh, sort of very fine suspended sediments in the water. The oil interacted with those and again, really helped to spread it over a very large area, interacted, and then the naturally occurring marine bacteria uh, out there helped to degrade it um, over time. And what that meant was there really wasn't uh, a surface slick. Mm -hmm. uh, and you can see in the area around the vessel, there on the beaches, I was there firsthand, and you can see these mm. head high waves crashing in, coming up the beach, but then washing back out again. So the black waves came in, but they came out without leaving that sort of characteristic span line. And what that meant was that, you know, compared to the Exxon Valdez, you know, twice the volume of oil at the Brea, but actually the, sort of the environmental impact was pretty minimal. Um, and that's because the face of the oil was determined by the process of evaporation and natural dispersion. But strong seas aren't always good news. Depending on the oil type, the churning of the waves can sometimes make the problem much worse. For example, look at this, the Erica in 1999. Similar sea conditions, but crucially a different oil type. On this occasion, it was a heavy fuel oil that was spilled. As we've seen, it's a completely different prospect. As the Maltese tanker sank off the French coast, the churning action of the waves captured droplets of seawater in the slick, creating a viscous emulsion. And here's the result, a shoreline that was heavily contaminated and a large-scale clean-up operation followed. So far we've seen how processes such as spreading, dispersion, evaporation and emulsification act on the oil immediately after a spill. But there are other processes to consider which take a bit longer. A less frequent process that can happen in shallow water is sedimentation. This is when sediment stirred up into the water column by intense wave action mixes with dispersed oil droplets and then slowly sinks to the seabed. When floating patches of heavier oil pick up suspended sediment, they can also sink to form dense tar mats presenting a challenge for the response. There's actually another process to be aware of. It may be slow, but it's one of the main mechanisms for getting rid of the last traces of oil from the marine environment. To find out more, I've come to Milford Haven to meet marine ecologist John Moore. He's attended spills all over the world and has spent many years studying their impact on marine organisms and communities. He's offered to explain how oil in the water is by no means a modern phenomenon and how nature has equipped itself with a solution. Oil is a natural material. It came from life eons ago, underground, uh, and in many places it does still seep out. Uh, we're using it and uh, life has adapted to, to use it. Over um, millions of years, life has evolved to use it as a foodstuff. The sea is teeming with microscopic organisms, some of which are able to break down oil into water-soluble compounds. It's a process known as biodegradation. And so when a spill occurs, what happens? Do these bacteria get to work immediately? Bacteria that are present in the water in, in large amounts uh, are immediately attracted to it. They will attach to the surface of the oil uh, and, and start to break it down. And obviously the, the larger the surface area there is of oil, the more bacteria can get onto it, multiplying rapidly and, uh, and breaking it down more rapidly. If the oil is broken up into small droplets into the water column through natural or chemical dispersion, this increases its surface area and accelerates biodegradation. 
By contrast, it's much slower if the oil is lying in thick layers on shorelines or if it gets mixed up with sediment on the seabed. So this isn't a substitute for removing bulk oil, but this is um, a process that, that sort of cleans up the rest of it once, once a lot of the response has happened. Well, all the oil that gets uh, remains in the marine environment uh, that, that we haven't taken out of the environment for, you know, in, our, in our response, uh, it will eventually get degraded by this, uh, these microorganisms. We've seen that from the moment oil hits the water, it is influenced by processes. Some of them take effect immediately, others, like biodegradation, can take months or years. Understanding these processes is crucial. There are so many factors to consider, and yet the need to deal with spills quickly and effectively is paramount. We can never know when an oil spill will strike, but if we understand how different oil behaves at sea, then we can at least be prepared. Planning is absolutely crucial. You can save precious moments right at the outset of a spill when the damage is potentially the greatest. I think it's essential to know the oil that's been spilt, to know how it's going to behave. Uh, forewarned is forearmed. Uh, I mean, in military terms, it's know your enemy. Because different oils behave very differently in the environment, it's really important to know the advantages and the drawbacks from different techniques so you can tailor for that particular spill the right blend of techniques that will minimise the impact. We've all come a long way since Torrey Canyon and learned some important lessons about the way oil behaves and of course we're still learning. Accidents will happen. What's important is to be ready for them when they do. And for more details on any of the issues in this series, have a look at the ITOF technical information papers at itof.com forward slash tips.